All right, hello everyone. How is it going? I'm uh, Matt. I work at Parse. Um, for those who haven't heard about Parse, we'll talk about it today and we'll, we'll get to learn about what it is. Um, I just kind of want to give you guys an intro about uh, what it is, what you can use it for, and uh, hopefully you can give it a try and tell us what you think. Uh, we're a little startup based in San Francisco, and we were acquired by Facebook back last May. And uh, since we joined Facebook, they've helped us a lot, kind of grow the platform and make it uh, a lot better. So basically, Parse is a backend as a service. So it helps you basically take care of the whole service side of building a mobile app. So if you want to build this in iOS or an Android app, if you need, you know, to boot up a Rails server or something, well, actually, here, let's, uh, let's go through it. If you have to build a mobile app, you'll start by, you know, having some kind of database and some kind of REST API in front of that, right? So if you're building a network app, you'll need those two. And on top of that, you need a server, all the business logic. You'll need, you know, security users around that. And even on the app side, you'll have to build all the networking layer on your app. If uh, you're using iOS, you'll probably have to deal with something like uh, AF networking. And, you know, that can get pretty complicated, especially when you're dealing with, you know, low reliability networks. You know, this is a user, like, going through a tunnel while you're saving some data, stuff like that. And as well as caching. So, you know, of course, the user doesn't have a connection, like they're on the train to London. They won't have any network, any, uh, network connections, so, you know, what, what do they see in your app? Can they see some data at least? And so all this stuff, you kind of have to do over and over again in every single app you build. And the, the reason we started Parse was to kind of abstract all that away into one easy-to-use service so that you don't have to rebuild that over and over again. Because, I don't know about you guys, but I don't particularly enjoy rebuilding, you know, a user authentication model every time I want to build an app. So we let you kind of just focus on the fun stuff. So that's building your UI, building your user experience, basically bringing your idea to life, basically the app you want to build. So how do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different SDKs. Um, today I'll give examples in the iOS SDK, so it'll be all Objective-C, but the API is extremely similar no matter what platform you want to use. And we try to support as many platforms as we can because we know that if you're building a mobile app built on Parse, then it's a lot easier for you to just you know, use an RSDK which will have a similar API on another platform if you want to make your app cross-platform. And you know, of course, if you're using Parse, then it would kind of suck if you have to you know, somehow use our REST API in some you know, other platform that we don't officially support. So we really try to have SDKs for as many platforms as we, as we can. And uh, they're not just, you know, thinly wrapped network requests. They're actually very, very big SDKs with a lot of stuff in there. And we do everything from caching, from, you know, dealing with offline requests, dealing with, you know, queuing things up and shooting off the requests if the user doesn't have a network connection. There's a lot of stuff in there that you basically just don't have to worry about as a developer. So let's take a look. Let's think of an app that, you know, you would build on your own server user. Something like Instagram. Something that has, you know, a lot of complicated data requests, saves a lot of stuff, queries a lot of stuff, and, you know, just is a fairly complicated app. So in Instagram, what do we have? We have users, right? So you can log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter, or log in with user and password. So they're not just normal users. They're actually users that integrate with social networks. You can, as a user, comment on people's posts, like posts. You can share your location when you do posts. You can, of course post pictures, and that's kind of the whole purpose. And as you do all these posts, you want to somehow see them too, right? So there's a way to fetch all the data back from the server. And uh, there's a follow, so it uses a very similar uh, model to Twitter, so you can follow the people, see their posts in my timeline. And finally, there's push notifications. So if you like my picture, I'll get a notification. kind of helps keep me engaged into the app. So let's take a look at all these these uh, different part portions of Instagram, and we'll break them down one by one and see how we can rebuild Instagram using Parse. So let's start with users. User is probably the biggest culprit of this, you know, recreating things over and over again in every single app. Because I'm sure if you've created an app, you've created some kind of authentication system. So maybe you use something like Rails, and uh, the newest version of Rails has you know a lot of stuff to kind of make this easy because it is something that's present in like every single app and every single you know, networked application. So how do we do users in Parse? Well, we try to think about it in the simplest terms possible. 
if you're writing an Objective C app or even an Android app or any kind of app, what would you want to do to create a user? Well, the simplest thing would just say, okay, create a user object, send a username, set a password, and just call a function, sign up. So that's all you have to do with parse. You just call those four lines of code, and you'll have the network request go out, that'll hit parse the server, it'll save that new user data, create the user collection if needed, save that new row in your database, return the confirmation, and log the user in. All with just that. So, you know, there's no, like, dealing with tokens, dealing with, you know, having to save that information somewhere. It's just kind of all abstracted away for you, and you just rely on that, creating a new user. That's it. Of course, at some point, you'll probably want to log out that user and log them back in. And that's just as simple. It's one method call, log in, give the username, give the password, and parse it the rest. There's one other really cool thing. At any time, with all of our SDKs, there's a function called current user, and that's a static function that's available as a single thing throughout your app, and you can always get your currently logged in user. So it's really useful for doing things like, you know, if current user is not nil, then show the login screen, and we'll let the user log in or sign up. Otherwise, show the home screen and show all the data you want. But now, as we said, uh, Instagram doesn't just have normal users. You can actually tie with Facebook and Twitter. And a lot of apps do that these days because it's a lot easier to just hit the, you know, log in with Facebook, log in with Twitter button, than to try and figure out, you know, another username and password that I have to use, verify the email, etc. So to do that with Parse, you uh, simply drop in the Facebook SDK as well as the Parse SDK and we'll automatically link to it. And if you want to link a new user, You'll just call link user. Or if you want to sign up a user, uh, all right, it's login. So you'll basically just call login, and then you'll pass in the permissions you want from Facebook. And that's the same as if you had called sign up with your username and password. But instead of using a custom username or custom password, we'll just take do all the work to uh, hit Facebook, get the token, get the authentication tokens, set that properly in, the, in your database, and then you have a login user. And every time you'll call that login function, if it's an existing user in your Parse database, then it'll just log them in instead of signing them up. And Twitter is basically the exact same functions. And uh, in this case, I don't think there's a Twitter SDK, so we actually take care of uh, all that code. So that's users. I mean, it's basically as simple as you could imagine to have users in your app. And so next is data. So users is kind of a special kind of data, right? It's one with you know this login and sign up function. So data is basically exactly the same thing, but without those functions. So let's take a look. Um, there's a, a class called PF object in the iOS SDK, and Android it would be just parse object. And you'll start by creating it with a class name. The class name will be basically the name of your table in your parse database. So you'll start by creating a new object, and then you basically have a dictionary. So you can set any kind of key and value for all the data that you want to save. So in this case, I'll say, okay, well, for the key text, I'll put great pick. For the key user, I'll put the current user. And I'll just call save. And with just those lines of code, very similar to the user, they'll go ahead, create that new row in your database, create that table if it doesn't exist. Um, we're actually completely based on MongoDB, so it's a completely NoSQL database. So there's no migrations to run before this would work. You actually just run those lines, and if none of that exists, it'll create the, the, the columns and create a class if necessary. And then here we can see an example that's the data browser, so it's kind of a web-based data based viewer. And here you would see the new comment class, the new row, create that and update that or two uh, fields that we manage automatically for you, and then you have your two columns. And the cool thing is that users, which we just saw, is basically the exact same thing, and is actually a subclass of an object. So at any point, you can do the exact same thing with the user. So I could say PF current user, and then say set you know, age to some number, set eye color to some number, and do the exact same thing with, uh, with users. So what about location? We said that Instagram, when you do new posts, you can actually share the location as well. Well, one way to do location is just the simple longitude latitude, and so we could just, on the phone, query the, uh, the GPS APIs, figure out where the user is, and save that to two columns. And that would work perfectly fine. To make it easier, though, we uh, actually have a special column type for that in parts. So here's the same comment I, I created earlier. 
and we'll focus in on those lines. So here I'm creating a PF geo point. I'm setting a longitude and latitude, and I'm saving it again as the object for a key. Now the benefit of doing that over just longitude and latitude as numbers is that this will later allow you to do geo queries. And uh, so one of the early features of Crest we, uh, we had at Parse was that people were saying, you know, I want all the data that's within two miles of this arbitrary location. And we couldn't really do that when you had columns of longitude and latitude because Parse didn't really have any knowledge of what those were. And it required the user to do a lot of work on their own end to kind of figure that out. So instead, we just added this type. And uh, this actually maps natively to something in Mongo to help us do this. So it basically just runs a query when you say two miles from location x, and we can easily just pull all these out pretty efficiently. And in the native browser, is very similar. You'll just see a new column with that geo point, and then you have the uh, coordinates in there. Now what about pictures? So a new post, a new comment, a new like, those would all just be random data objects. But a picture is a bit different, right? Because it's binary data. It's not just text or numbers or geo points. So to do that, we have another special column type. So here we have a new object we're creating. This time it's from the class named picture. We're putting a new key, a new object for the key title, just a string. And then if we look at these lines here, that's where we're creating the image. So NS data, that's using the uh, just the iOS APIs for representing binary data. And we're creating a PF file. So it's very similar to PF geopoint. It's just some particular parse data type. And here we're setting the data to the image's data. There's one special thing here that we didn't have to do with geopoints, and that's that you have to save this image separately from the object it's tied to. So here we're saying image file, save in background, and then later we're saying picture, and then we'll save that. So the benefit of this is that an image might take, I don't know, 30 seconds to completely upload to, to, uh, to the database, right? Because, you know, the user is outside on a 3G connection and it's a 3 megabyte uh, image, it might take a while. So what you can actually do is save the data object and the image completely separately from each other. So you can say, okay, create this new image, the user just took the image, I'll start uploading it now. And then as the user types in their first comment, you know, sets up where he wants to share, is looking at a different screen, maybe he'll spend 15, 20 seconds there, you're uploading the image already. And then later, when you'll tie it to the actual picture PF object and save the PF object, Parse will take care of manually queuing those up, and we'll make sure that they're all queued up and sent to the server in the right order, and you don't have to really worry about it. And you just saved, you know, 15, 20 seconds while the user was looking at a different screen to save the image. But, you know, of course, you can just ignore the uh, image file save in background, not even call it, and we'll make sure that it's called for you when you save the PF object it's attached to. And again here, it's the same thing. We see you know, the title I just saved, it's up here, and then we have a file type and a new column. So I've been showing you kind of these snippets at the bottom of the data browser, and that's a cool tool that we let you kind of browse and query your data on the web. This is a picture of it right here. It's not the greatest resolution on the, the screen, but basically you just see all your classes on the left, all your data on the right, and you have a, a filter UI to kind of help you find all the data you want. Um, it's great for doing some admin work. If you're you know, curious how many of my users are doing X or you know, I have to modify some static data somewhere, it's very easy to use to uh, kind of see what's going on in your app. So back to our Instagram breakdown, we saw users that was using PF users, we saw Facebook and Twitter, which was with the uh, native user tie-ins with the, uh, the two social networks. Comments and likes, those are just both VPF objects, where you can save just arbitrary data as a dictionary. We saw location, that was using PF geopoints, which was basically just a simple wrapper around longitude and latitude that allows you to do a lot more powerful queries later on. And then we had pictures, that was using uh, PF files. And you just tie that to a PF object, and you save the object. So now next is displaying all this data that you save. So obviously, you know, showing that timeline feature is like the main feature of Instagram. So how do you do that? Well, that's using queries, getting all this stuff you've saved back down. Now we don't know natively support SQL since we're using Mongo, which is a NoSQL database. So we have our own query language that's basically just adding constraints to what you want to see. So let me give you an example. If you want to get some pictures, let's, for your, let's say for your timeline, you'll just say create a new query and you'll say the class name, picture, because that was the name of our collection. 
then we'll just set some constraints. So you'll say where the key user is equal to the current user logged into the app. Where the key created at is greater than some data we can go. So I'll get all of my pictures in the last week. And then I'll call find objects in background. So just one method, and then I get a block with a callback. So with just these little kind of simple constraints that you put on a query, I can get all my data back. And then I've been showing kind of these in background uh, functions throughout the presentation, and they all have an option with a block, which will give you a callback. A block, for those who are familiar with Objective C, is basically just a really simple way to get a callback. And it's very similar to how you would do it in JavaScript, where you know if you call Ajax and you pass them a success uh, callback function, and then you kind of just write your function in line. It's very similar to how Objective C does it. I um, mean, in Java and Android, we have you know some a little more complicated way because of how Java works, but it's very similar in principle. So an example of a block here would just be I'm getting back an array of objects, and they'll just contain all my results for my query, and I can just iterate through them, display them, do whatever I need to. Now, there's one really important thing with query, and that's caching. So of course, if I run my query on my screen, then I click on one of the images. When I go back to that original timeline screen, I don't want to be running that entire query again and re-downloading all those images for nothing. So queries support several different kinds of uh, caching policies. And those are all maintained by Parse, and you don't have to worry about it. You just set which one you want. And the most popular one is probably cache then network. What that means is that as soon as you run that query, it'll run against the local cache that we save on your, uh, on your device, and then we return the results from that in the callback you provide. And then we actually run the exact same query against the network, and we'll rerun that callback once we get the results from the network. So that's a great way to see some kind of uh, old cache data on your phone when you open the app. And then as soon as the network quits gets complete, if it does, you'll see the updated results, which is kind of the typical way these things will work on mobile app. But you know, they, depending on your, your particular use case, there's different things you can do. You can ignore the cache completely, ignore the network completely, um, only hit the cache if there's no network, different things like that. So that's queries. So you can actually do some very powerful stuff. Um, I only showed kind of the basic, you know, where key equals, where key greater than. Um, but you can do kind of the uh, constraints through relations. So you can say where, you know, this constraint, uh, where this key matches a result from this other query. So you can do some pretty complicated stuff. And there's very few things that you won't be able to get out. Um, so next is relations. So how you would do a, a follow relation like Twitter, like Instagram, so you can follow other people and only see their results in your timeline. Um, so relational data is, is a little bit tricky in, in databases in general. Um, I probably the, the simplest use case is just a one-to-many, where let's say one post belongs to, uh, or many, many posts belong to one user. That's kind of like the, the typical example, or I guess comment would be the same thing. So to do that with parse, we actually saw an example already of this. You just literally set another object as the value for a key. So here I'm creating a comment, and then I'm just setting a PF user, which is just like a PF object, as the value for a key. If I had a post instead, I could say, set the object, my post, for the key, post. And Parse will automatically manage that relation for you. And all you have to do is that when you query for that object, you'll say include key to say, also pull down the second attached object to it, and you'll have it. So it's a lot more simple than trying to say, you know, follow the foreign key relationship, and kind of manage all that yourself, and just send you the data. Um, it gets a little more tricky when you get to many, many relations, because in a typical database situation, you'll create what's called a join table, right? So you'll have table one, table two, your foreign keys, and you'll have that in your join table to kind of manage that relationship through it. And that's how you can have, you know, let's say, many users following many other users. So to do that in parse, you can just do a join table and manage it yourself, and that'll work perfectly fine. And in many cases, that's the ideal situation, and that's what you want. Um, in those few circumstances where it's actually a fairly simple many-to-many -many relationship, you can use a special class in parse. So the follow relationship is one of these, uh, these special use cases. So here I'm just getting a current user, and I'm saying create a new PF relation. So this is basically the join table, if you will. It's basically an array of all those objects that's going to be tied to. So here I'm just saying, create a new PF relation, and I'm adding new objects to it. In this case, other users. So I'm adding a new friend, I'll add another one, and then I just simply save this, uh, this user, 
which has this relation typed to, and then all this data will be saved to the database. And if I go to my data browser, I would literally see a relation in that, in that column, and I can click on it and see all the users that are part of it. So that kind of just helps me manage that uh, many for many relationship a bit easier. The last thing is push notification. So we mentioned in Instagram, when I like a photo or I comment on it, you'll get a push saying that your friend interacted with it. And it is a great way to kind of keep the user engagement up. And we have two different models for pushes. One is kind of the, the typical typical thing you'll see in, in most of the services that, uh, that offer push notifications, and that's channel. So usually a device will subscribe to a particular channel. And here, Mobile DEF CON, which is uh, another conference I was at the other day. And uh, I'll just say, okay, well, when I'm ready to send a push, I'll send to all the subscribers of that channel. At any point, if I want to not have, uh, not have those messages anymore, I'll just call unsubscribe. So that's how most services will usually work. And uh, in most implementation that you would probably do by yourself, that's probably what you would do since it's, it's fairly simple to get started with. Um, there's a much more powerful way to do this, though, and um, this is something that we kind of came up with because we have access to all the actual data for your app, and that's pushing to a query. So what's really cool is that every device on Parse is we automatically create an installation class for it. So an installation basically represents what install of your app on a device. So it uniquely identifies that install of an app. And what this allows us to do is that you can save data on this installation just like with a PF object. This is just a subclass of a PF object. And so here I'm actually setting the uh, current user as the owner key for that installation. And then later, I can create a query and say, let's say all the, all the users that are near this path. And I can send them all a push just based on that query of all these users. And because we have access to that data, it's very easy for us to just run that query get the installations, and send them all the push notifications. So it's a really powerful way to do these um, these kind of geo-based queries, these kind of dynamic segments where it's not really practical to constantly subscribe and unsubscribe users from channels. So back to our Instagram breakdown, we saw displaying all data. Well, that was using queries, right? So that's how we'll pull down all the data. Um, to create... Oh, wrong way. To create follow relationships, that would be with PF relations, or by just creating your own join table, which then just becomes normal PF objects. And push notifications, we saw both subscribe, or pushing to a channel, as well as pushing to a query. Now that kind of completes all of that you would need to build Instagram, but I'm sure you're thinking, well, you know, that's a very kind of shallow look at what Instagram is. And it's definitely a lot more complicated than just those kind of low, kind of broad features we looked at. And that's very true, because all we saw was very client-side, right? And we do kind of encourage developers to kind of move as much as possible to the client, because we want to abstract out the, that server level as much as possible. But it does happen where you need to write some business logic, some third-party integration, some you know, cron tasks that don't really belong on the client. So for that, we create what's called cloud code. So cloud code is basically JavaScript in the cloud. So as I showed at the beginning, I don't know if you noticed, but we have a JavaScript SDK. So what we did is that we brought this JavaScript SDK in a completely server environment, and which is actually very similar to Node. We don't actually use Node itself because Node is not very easily sandboxed, but we went straight to V8. So we have our own instance of V8 running that processes all this JavaScript and that we run on our servers and where you have our JavaScript SDK available at all time. And you can do some really cool stuff. So, let me show you a basic example. The simplest way to use cloud code is just create a function. A function that you can hit from a REST API, you can hit from our SDKs, just by you know calling one function, and you just have to define it in cloud code. So you'll say parse.cloud to define, you'll give it a name. In this case, let's say we want the average likes. If you want to find the average likes of all your photos, without this, well, you have to download all the photos on the client, just add them all together, divide them by the total number, and then you'd have that average. Well, it's not very practical to get all download all the data down to the phone just for that one number. So this is a great example of how you would use cloud code. So you just create a new query, very similar to what we already saw. You'll say, okay, give me all the photos, add some constraints, in this case, all the user's photos, and we want all of them, so that's all we'll do. And then we'll just say dot find. And in the callback, we'll simply 
take all the results, sum them up, divide them by the total number of results, and have an average. I simply return that, and the user will have that. Sorry, that average. And of course, we can do some, uh, some error handling. So that's kind of a basic example of what you can do. But there's actually a lot more than that. Um, on top of just having these arbitrary functions, you can do some hooks. So let's say I want to make sure every single comment I create, or that a user, user creates, is no more than 140 characters. And I want to make sure on the server side, because you know, sure I can do some, uh, some checking and validation. Did I lose these screen? Oh no, it's just black. Um, so you know, of course, I can use some uh, validation on the client side, but some user could you know sniff out my API, just do a curl request, and bam, you'd have a comment that's a million characters. So for that, instead of creating uh, last time we had defined to create an arbitrary function, I can do before save, and then I specify the class I want to do this hook on, and in this case, comment. And then here I'll just grab the text from the from the uh, comment objects, comment object, and I'll make sure that it's less than 140 characters. I'll sub out the last three characters with dots if, uh, if it is longer, and then I'll just say, go ahead and save it. At this point, you could just say, instead of uh, subbing out with three points, you could just say, reject the, the request completely, and we'll make sure that the object is not saved. So that's kind of like the basic use cases of cloud code. Create functions, create hooks. There's an after save as well. I think there's an after delete too as well. But you can do more than just interact with parse. You can interact with a bunch of third-party APIs. Um, we create a bunch of, uh, of modules to kind of integrate with the main requests that we got. So that includes Stripe for doing payment processing, includes a bunch of uh, different mail providers, Twilio for sending SMSs. But of course, if you have your own third-party service you want to use, or even your own server that you want to hit, you can do external HTTP requests pretty easily. And you just specify the URL, basically the same as uh, a typical AJAX request you would do from a web page, just done from our servers. But now, these usually have a, uh, a timeout of about 15 to 20 seconds based on the load. And for most requests that you would want to do that's synchronous on a user's device, that's fine. In fact, Rails usually, I think, is about 30 seconds. And for most requests, it'll be, it'll be fine. But there'll be times where you'll want to do some long-running job. So maybe you want to do some image processing. Maybe you want to migrate an entire table and change you know, all the value of a certain field to X. And for those, we have what's called background jobs. And these are basically cron tasks, where you can set a repeating schedule if you want. You can do every 15 minutes do this, every week do this. And these have a, a timeout of about 30 minutes. So you can do some really cool stuff like user migration. So let's say I'm just adding a new column. And uh, I want to basically iterate over each of my users in my table, whether that's 10 million or 100. And I want to set all the uh, value columns to some value I pass in. So with just these lines of code, I can say repeat this every week, or well, I guess this would be uh, kind of pointless to repeat, but if I add this new column, I want to make sure that this column has this value for everyone. I just have to run this, and within a few minutes, all my table will have, uh, my whole user table will have this value. And you can do some really you know, crazy stuff like uh, hitting a bunch of different REST APIs to you know, maybe have a a news app and you want to get a bunch of news from different sources, and you would just run this every 15 minutes, hit all your news sources, make sure you're up to date, send push notifications to update your users of those new articles. It would be kind of a, an easy uh, use case for something like this. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle is parse hosting. So what we saw is very contained to you know hitting APIs that hit parse and helping you kind of make your, uh, your mobile app a bit better and a bit more powerful and give you that flexibility you need. Parse hosting is uh, something we actually recently released, and kind of opens up the entire cloud code environment for you to do basically whatever you want. And so we actually have the entire Express framework, which is a node framework kind of similar to Sinatra or even Rails, and it allows you to write entire web apps on Parse. So using, using Express, you can first host all your files on Parse, so JavaScript, HTML files, all that gets hosted on Parse. So, in fact, using you know kind of just basic hosting, you could just have a single page JavaScript app where you just kind of do all your requests AJAX and just host that as static files, and it would serve them for you. If you want a dynamic website, though, as kind of most websites today, you can actually easily do that with Express on Parse, where you would 
makes them write this in your cloud code. So this time just um, initializes Express. It's the exact same syntax you would use in, in Node.js. Um, you set a few different uh, uh, parameters here. We're just saying where my view files will be. I'm using the EGS view, view engine. We, we, uh, we also support Jade, which is kind of the, the uh, handle style syntax. EGS, in this case, is very similar to the ERB file syntax in, uh, in Rails, if you're familiar with those. And then I can basically do any kind of endpoints I want. So here I'm saying, okay, well, for the slash um, route, which is just my root directory, I want to render hello, which is a view I have somewhere, and pass it, I pass in the message hello world. So what that would look like is as soon as I call app listen, which starts my server, I would see this web page, this hello world, basic web page, at, uh, when I hit my website. And you set the, uh, the URL that you want in your settings and parse somewhere. So you can build basically entire websites just as easily using parse. And this would also apply if you just want to, uh, to have kind of a raw body in your, in your cloud code. So if you want to write a function that's used as a callback for another service, uh, something like uh, Crowdflower, for example, which is an image monitoring service where you send them a bunch of images and they use, I think they actually use Mechanical Turk or they used to, to have actual people look at images and they'll let you know if they're inappropriate or not. And so you can use a service like that, which hits your API back with a response to basically support any response you want from these other third-party services. And they'll, they'll let you know, you know if that image was OK or not. And in this callback, you can easily set a field in your images table that will you know, flip that image to be shown in your app. So basically, cloud code we saw is JavaScript in the cloud, very similar to what Node.js is. And it supports these basic functions that you can call from your app these hooks that you can put on classes like before save, after save, before delete, after delete. And we have background jobs, which kind of extends that to have a much longer timeout, and you can use for doing cron tasks or scheduled tasks. And finally, there's uh, parse hosting, which allows you to basically host entire websites and have kind of more, uh, more to the metal access to the server that we provide you. But that's basically enough to create all that Instagram offers at the moment, including the web portion of it. And I didn't actually pick Instagram for no reason. We actually built Instagram on Parse. It's called AnyPick. And it's a completely open source. It's a fairly big app. Um, it is basically like a production-ready app that you can actually download on your phone now. It's on the App Store. You just search for AnyPick. And uh, we put up all the source code on GitHub. Um, we actually seen like about a couple dozen of kind of pretty shameless clones of it, of people that just kind of changed the name and put them back on the App Store. But uh, I, I really encourage you to just check it out, even if you're just kind of starting with iOS and you're curious to see how kind of a, a pretty hefty app would look like. Um, we didn't use any uh, of the storyboards or was it, the nibs. We just built it kind of all in code, so it might be a little bit tricky if you're not used to, to seeing that kind of style of iOS apps. But um, I definitely encourage you to check it out, and you'll see all the, the parts, parts in there as well. And uh, we also have a bunch of other tutorials. AnyWall and Parser, which are two other apps we put up on the App Store. Um, AnyWall is a cool kind of geolocation app where you can drop a message somewhere and somebody has to get close enough to it to actually view what the message says. And the Parse Store is a uh, store we built along with Stripe to kind of show off how to use the Stripe API and you can buy t-shirts and stuff from Parse. And they're all, of course, completely open source and you can check them out. We, we usually do a pretty good job at making sure the design is actually really well done and uh, open sourcing them and letting people see how, how we did them. And uh, that's Parse. Any, uh, any questions? I just wondered if the Cool, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's like one of our number one questions. So um, I actually built AnyPick with, uh, with another guy, Parse Hector. And um, we, we've talked a lot about doing an Android version of it. I think if we do, we will definitely do, at the moment we don't have that many Android sample apps, and we do want to have more of them. Um, I think if we do kind of that like type of, of like scale of an app for Android, we're probably just going to try and do something a little bit different, just to kind of have you know, a more variety of examples. But uh, yeah, we, we are definitely focusing on doing more Android stuff, because it's pretty iOS heavy at the moment. Yeah, I 
Yeah, so yeah, we definitely do want to do some some uh, some bigger Android stuff, and we do have a couple in the works. I think we I don't know if we released it, but we are definitely working on an Emuwall version of uh, Android version, uh, which if it's not out already, should be out pretty soon. Uh, but yeah, we're we're definitely working on some some more Android stuff. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh well, secret. This, um, I've been using Pulse a fair amount, um, and for the most part, I really like it. I really like the stuff that's Glad to hear it. coming through. But the bit that sucks really, really hard. Tell me, please tell me. Uh, there is no way of exporting your data and <laughs> your schema yeah. properly and re-importing it back in again. But so it's, it's great that you say this. More, Actually, more to the point. So, so, so come talk to me afterward. Um, okay. I'm personally working on that at the moment. Absolutely. So, so yeah, it's it, it's a com- so it's a complete pain. Yeah. Duplicate. So I've got dev. Duplicate. Come, come, come talk to me after. That, that's exactly what we're we're thinking of doing. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of ridiculous. For a while, we didn't support the same format for importing and exporting. We're now we kind of can do it. You can export an Elixir as JSON, and you can re-import each class individually as JSON. Yep. That's like the crappy way we have now. Um, but like, you can't export your cloud code. You can't export your settings. It's dubious of relationships. Oh yeah, yeah. We, 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 there, there's a couple bugs there, I think. Dubious well, yeah. on users and internal classes. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's definitely something that uh, is like P priority one right now. Good to hear. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, uh, that's Pars. Um, I'll be around if you guys have any questions. And uh, you can email me at matt.pars.com if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, guys.